In 1992, we had a crazy scare campaign for many about the Mabo decision. I'd like to know how many of you on the panel know any non-Indigenous people who had blackfellas performing corroborees with their extended families and had their backyards ripped up and taken over. Are we likely to see a repeat of these ludicrous crimes when a referendum is called about constitutional change? Julian Lisa. Well, look, I, I hope that we're not. Um, uh, I don't know anybody who, uh, who, who had their backyard claim, but uh, um, I think we need to remember what a revolution um, in the law Mabo was at the time. Um, it, it's such a historic case and we're talking about it because it changed the law so much from what had been there beforehand. I think if I can go back to the point that uh, um, you, you put to, to Gail, uh, um, I think the key thing that's come out of Mabo is actually native title itself. Since Mabo, there have been 577 determinations of native title. Native title now covers 43% uh, of the Australian landmass, which is, which is extraordinary. Um, at the time, you're right, uh, there was lots of concern from mining interests and pastoralists about the effect of native title. But now, mining companies and pastoralists uh, are some of the, the people who are most forward-looking in terms of trying to find ways of working with Indigenous people to try and get benefits for them. And I think that's the next mm. phase for dealing with native title. Well, we're broadly. going to pick up that question of native title in just a moment because there are still questions remaining about that and potential need for reform. But just to come back to, to the question here, Chris Kenny, what's the, the risk of, a, of an old-style culture war? around this, around the voice, around the, the referendum on the Uluru Statement from the Heart, with all of the, the scare campaign that we've seen in the past. Yeah, certainly I remember the Mabo scare campaigns. It was revolutionary. It was, there was a lot of uncertainty in the country and there was, of course, as you say, some ridiculous uh, scares perpetrated. You get that in all debates. We're getting that all the time in the climate debate. We get them all around all sorts of political issues. So far, the debate on the voice in my, has, has seen some furfies put up. We've seen the furphy put up about this being a third chamber. That was uttered by Prime Minister at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, and another former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has used that phrase as well. Barnaby Joyce, interestingly, interestingly enough, used that phrase, then recognised it was erroneous and apologised for using it. But um, it, it, it's, it, that's not an outrageous scare. But there's, there's been the other, the other point about the voice that we hear all the time, and I'll, I'll continue to address this in public debate and, and in what I write is that it's divisive, is that it's racially divisive. And to me, this is a perversion of a debate. This is a measure entitled to redress Indigenous disadvantage, to uh, be uh, fair and just to Indigenous is, people is in our one, country. Is that what won you over? Because, you know, you, from a conservative political position to embrace the idea of the voice, what was it that convinced you? Because of the, the potential to have better outcome? Was that the, 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 the thing that won you? The, the two things that won me over, and Shireen and I were talking about this in depth many, many years ago, seven or eight years ago, I suppose. But the, the, the two key points is one is to protect the constitution, and this is where Julian's done a lot of work, mm. a constitutional change that won't lead to all sorts of judicial activism. And I was satisfied that that could be done through this measure. But most importantly, that it would lead to practical outcomes for Indigenous people. The Indigenous leaders I was speaking to said, don't give us symbolism. We've had enough of your mm. symbolism over the years. Don't just make some quaint reference to us in the preamble to the Constitution. What does that deliver for Indigenous Australians? But through this measure, there can be an enduring guarantee that Indigenous Australians are consulted about laws made to impact on them. What could be fairer? What could be more just? And you're actually then recognising Indigenous Australians in the Constitution in a practical and useful way so that when they give feedback from the grassroots to government, it will help deliver better education outcomes. It will help deliver better health, better prosperity, job opportunities, better law and order. These are all the practical things that people like Jacinta Price and, and other conservative politicians want to see. Well, the voice is a way to help deliver it. Shereen Morris, as, as Chris said, you've worked across the, the political aisle. You ran for Labor in the Senate at the recent election. You're also an Indian Australian, and I'm wondering what multicultural Australia, and I know you can't speak for everybody, I don't want to put that onto you, but, but is there a sense of what people who don't necessarily share the colonial legacy of the country um, feel about something like the Uluru Statement from the Heart? Absolutely, and I think there's this growing sentiment in the Australian community, particularly among multicultural Australians and, interestingly enough, multi-faith 
Australians. So just last Friday, there was a joint resolution released by all the peak religious organisations of Australia. But it's not just in those who have this empathy of shared historical experience with, you know, colonial powers overseas. I do really believe there is a deep reservoir of goodwill amongst Australians in favour of this issue. And I think that transcends left or right. You know, I really do. I think this is bigger than ordinary political divides. And I think there's a tonne of goodwill on the political right for this um, issue. So, yeah, getting back to the question, I think there will be some scare campaigns and there will be some furfies, as Chris said, put out there. But I think we're in a really good position to tackle those head on, have a respectful, open, honest debate address the mistruths when they come up in a rational, calm way. And I think the advocates in this um, issue have done the groundwork to do everything possible to get Conservatives on side to minimise that nasty side of the debate because, as Chris explained, um, Indigenous advocates did the hard yards to reach out to constitutional mm. Conservatives, right, early on in the piece. So, as Julian knows really well, this is the only constitutional reform proposal on the table that empowers Indigenous people with a voice in their affairs on the one hand, but also upholds and protects the Constitution, protects parliamentary supremacy. So that's why I think we're going to have a nicer and more rational debate than in the past.